Um, morning, everyone. Um, we're here again doing our co-reading experience with a red black girl and me, Ngozi, in Khaborone. And Timelo's joining us via her lovely voice on my video chat on Facebook Messenger. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Um, so today we're reading, uh, or we're, we're going over chapter seven, which is facing and feeling loss. And I don't know how y'all's experience was with reading the book or how your experience was, Dumelo, with reading that chapter rather. Um, but uh, for me, it was quite difficult to swallow and it took me, I had to read it in parts. I had to read like the first part last night. And then I read the second sort of half of the chapter this morning. Um, yeah. Because I think it was quite, hmm, it was quite heavy. It caused one to kind of, it caused me to, to introspect in various ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and I, I don't know yeah. if, you know, if you, if you'd like to share as well, any kind of, any, any of your, your first impressions, um, about the chapter and yeah, what it brought to mind. So I only read this chapter this morning, right? Um, and, and when I, when I saw the title, I was like, ah, shoot. This is not the time um, to be talking about grief and loss. I, <laughs> yeah. Got into it, right? Yeah. And then the first part was A. I was just like, because she was very light in the, in, the, in the first part. So I was just like, okay, okay, cool. And then, because it's also like, a, um, it's also like um, not too long. Um, and then when she got in deep, I was like, ah, I needed to pull out. It was like, eject, eject, eject. <laughs> And I just needed to pull out and I spent the entire morning in my garden. I literally was just like, I don't know if I want to go back to this. Um, and then an hour ago, I came back and then I read the rest of the chapter. And it was it was also heavy for me. Mm. You know, I'm just, it, yeah, it was, there was a lot to take in. Um, yeah. Um, I can completely relate with that as well because, um, my first kind of overall impression was that, I mean, it's it's lovely, and I made it here to say, especially in the beginning, um, it feels like mm. it like Hooks is creating sort of like it's a record of of death, the way we we've, we've dealt with death, sort of the physical death mm. of you know a loved one or a family member, um, the meaning of death, the rituals surrounding it. Um, and the way that, you know, historically, um, especially within African American communities, it's become sort of a place of grief, yes, but also rejoice, like rejoicing the life and honoring the life um, of those who have passed or the person or whoever has passed and also giving a space to loss, you know, because she goes into what happens at the wake um, et cetera, at sort of like a physical funeral in a physical funerary space. Um, and then also it's sort of like a record of how we also make sacred those who have passed and passed on because she does touch as well on, you know, sort of honoring ancestors and those who came before us, um, which was much kind of easier, I think, for me to deal with than further on in the chapter where she talks about periods in life where we're actually grieving, like where, where we're grieving loss and not in the sort of physical sense of losing someone we love, um, but that kind of pervasive feeling of loss and um, sadness that a number of, of people deal with, um, you know, dealing with depression and anxiety and, and, and. Um, which was a lot harder, I think, to to deal with and to read and to engage with, um, content-wise. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
and I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking about two things, right? So, the so first, I'm thinking about you know, the, the the part where she talks about um, celebrating one's life, mm. and um, and you know, and how what grieving was, right? Historically, you know, how going through the motions, and you know, you know, with us. I mean, I was complaining recently about the lock, the week long um, week long funerals that we have, um, but how costly it is, you know, and put that perspective that you know, when you go through that, um, see people, we can not write it, but you know, that's hard for that to come, in, you know, um, mourn with you, and 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 then you get to a point where you have mourn, you have grief, and then you celebrate the life, right? Yes. And, uh, yeah, and goes on to talk about how in the white society we live in, we don't have that anymore, right? Um, the, I mean, <laughs> I remember we had a um, you know, in my mom's complex, right? Mm. And <clears throat> happened during the week, and then obviously started kept coming in, and security kept very small, and um, so the first thing that happened is that they put somebody at the open for everybody that came in right and then there was like a, so we have a whatsapp group and then um somebody on the whatsapp group was like why is it at the opening so clearly the rules say you're not to put in for other people right first thing second thing it's 20 cars pull up parking in driveways people do not like it mm. right it's not a, yeah then obviously we like um church services every afternoon the complaints again right people are just like why are you know you know the the body corporate this is what is supposed to happen this noise is expensive you know so <laughs> those spaces that we live in won't allow us to like go through the motions but also the way that we bury late like now like in the so in the township now we've got culture of um having the um, yeah, I think that's what they call mm. division. Where after, so after, like from hearing, they like a party. Eh, hey, hey, hey. So, uh, has your name after tears? Yes. So you have like, yeah, but yeah, but but you see now, I think I I think if somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it, it's called also VC nons because you know VC nons. It's like you go you're going to a funeral right, and you're dressing up for the funeral, but afterwards because it's like a party, it's like who sees us, right? So we oh, like that's what that means. Bed. Yeah, it's Afrikaans for like who sees us, like VC nons, right? Yes. So we. But it becomes a whole thing. So it, when it started, it was like a celebration of the life. So now we're not crying anymore. We are like after party, right? Yes. We are now celebrating. But now it's like so excessive. And, and I, I noticed it also moved to the graveyard where now the party is also at the graveyard, right? It, people are dancing on top of cars. People are. It's oh, a wow. whole thing. Yeah, the whole thing. And we also, I mean, they used to be like, you know, black used to be for mourning. Yes. We used to wear black, you know, and the greys and the navies. And and now people wear white. We wear red. We wear so the, the respectability of, of of grieving and mourning our people is just fading away. Um, hmm. So, yeah. So I don't think too much, but I, I just, you know, I just want into something that happened recently so we had um so in my life we've done my father right? and after my dad passed on to like go to funerals for a very long and he passed on like 10 years ago so so we had uh, like other funeral like family just before the lockdown we had two funerals back to back right one for my stepfather and then the other one to my pattern, right? Mm. I didn't be because the moment it happened, it was just okay. So the the, the first funeral, like my was just like I just and it all had to come together, right? So and I'm nearest to him, like ninety k's away. So and he's just here. So I needed to come together. We were there like during the 
and organizing and everything mm. and everything. So it was such a rush. And on the day of the funeral, you know, me and my mom were like doing the things and, you know, um, I was helping them. So it's like my god, give you one, right? And then we were just, so I didn't go bury him, right? Mm. Um, it whole an event, right, for me. I was just organized, like organizing it. Then I went home, I rested for, for like two days, you know, and it was the same type of things where I went, you know, and with this one, you know, I was, I was ready to grieve and, and everything because now I'm at home and there's the whole day. So then I was, you know, I, I was just going to like let go. Right? Mm. Um, but I couldn't because then in the night my child like started an ear infection and I am like 120 k down. It's in a rural area. It's in the middle of the night. Um, what right? And this time for over an hour, nothing is pacified. So I drive. So I'm. It's like easy, and then I'm just like you know what? I'm not gonna sit here what's going to happen with my child and then I, drive, I go to the hospital then I come so in the morning so I left like just before midnight and when I come back everybody's like relaxed rest, right? so yes. I, it's over you know yes. everybody's just sitting there and relaxing and eating and, and I'm just like wow um I didn't get to do this I didn't grieve I didn't nothing right and it was also monday so then because mondays work and if right and yes. then it's lockdown so the whole time and when i'm reading the chapter i'm just thinking of like those two senses. i just ah they were just like events i they were not funerals for it didn't feel like funeral i did nothing up felt like funeral so yeah um yeah, I just wanted to just share about like how not well, how just realize I'm not right the loss in my life. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and, and you know, it 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 raises an interesting sort of point of discussion as well because I've heard you know various young people. I think particularly. Um, you know how we sometimes question some of our sort of traditional or cultural ways of doing things. And the idea of like a week long period of mourning and um, organizing, like the way you were talking about the fact that despite the fact that you had lost someone so close to you, you didn't even get a chance to process or deal with a lot of those things because you were like, okay, then I have to do this, then I have to call that person, then I have to organize this, then there's Dea, there's Disconse, there's is Mangwanisa Mangmang okay? Like there's all of these um, organizational things that of course, yes, the family engages in and gets into, but I know that a number of young people have been questioning this thing, but must our tradition of, you know, Mirapelo, Khangya Mirapelo, yeah, a week long and being there all the time. Is it actually helpful for the mourning family or has it become, um, or are we realizing or maybe seeing that it's, it, it can be significantly more stressful for the mourning family because, yeah. you know, instead of sitting with their grief and being able to process, they're not, like nobody has time to do that um no. so it's it's a really interesting um i think i guess opportunity and especially now because um i remember a couple of weeks ago my my dear friend um lost her uncle as well and because of the yeah. because of the the issue, yeah, yeah, COVID nineteen. Um, is everything okay? 
in. Oh, I'm just, in. oh, I see. Oh, I also, see. Dudu came online. Sorry, you look like you were concentrating really hard. <laughs> Hi, Dudu. <laughs> um, sorry. So back, back to that. Uh, a dear friend lost her uncle. And because of the restrictions on um, gatherings and social distancing, the family had quite, yeah. um, it was an, a really hectic and difficult time for them because they had to now re, um, reorganize and review the way that they were used to burying their loved ones because you can't have more than 50 yeah. people in the same space. Um, you know, food and drinks must be limited. Then there was the whole hand washing thing. So it became really intense because it's like, uh, like, who do you, who do you invite? Who do you call to come and mourn with you? And we can't now be gathering every day over an entire week. You know, it, it, it's only the, the day of perhaps the day of the burial. So it was, I guess that was also like a, an interesting sort of point of reflection, like, how are we showing up for, I suppose, ourselves during the grieving process, but also for those who have lost their loved ones? How are we showing up for them? Um, thank you so much for bringing that up, right? Because I have a friend and I actually really like met him at, at one of our book clubs and he recently lost his mother, right? Um, and I remember saying to him, because he had a daughter at the beginning of the last year, and I and then I, I couldn't see him the whole of last year. I tried, but our schedules just weren't working. And then at the beginning of this year, I was like, you know what? I'm going to start class in Joburg. So I, we need to, like, organize. And then in response, he said, actually, my mom passed away. And I am in the process of moving back to Durban to put my life back together because it's just not working in Joburg. And I have like an hour on Sunday. And I mean, I don't know what was happening on that Sunday, but I just couldn't make it to Joburg. And then that whole week, I was just thinking about him, right? But I, I didn't know what to do besides just SMS him and say, hey, I'm thinking about you, uh, you know, hey, how are you holding up, right? And it didn't feel like it was enough. It honestly did not feel like it was enough. I just felt like I'm just not not coming through mm. for him. Um, yeah. And I love how you brought that up now as well because I'm. I'll be honest in saying I also I, I, I I'm very awkward around the subject of death and the loss of a loved one, um, especially you know, for, you know, for, for a friend or for someone who's close, because I, I never know what to say, because what do you say to someone who's lost a person who's so close to them, you know, who has meant so much to them? Um, and, you know, it's always just the thing of look like if, you know, if you, you know, if you need me, I'm here type thing. Um, and of course, you know, being there to assist in any way that you can with the practical stuff. Um, However, like, I remember um, there was, you know, when my cousin passed away a few years ago, um, it was quite a difficult time, I think, for, um, for the family. And I could relate completely to, well, maybe not completely, but I could relate somewhat when you were talking about not um, maybe feeling like you had the opportunity to grieve necessarily. Um, perhaps though, in my case, it was a different kind of reason because, you know, my younger cousin, we weren't, we weren't very close. We were quite far apart in age actually. Um, and so yeah. we weren't very close when we became adults and we grew up. Um, but when he passed, I felt obviously quite a, a profound sense of loss, but in a way I also felt like I wasn't almost entitled to grieve as much as maybe his older sister, you know, like my other cousin or, you know, his mom, his dad, or his close friends or, or those who were much closer to him. And I think sometimes, um, 
I think sometimes that's a that's a thing as well that that can also like pervade um I guess our lives and our experiences of grief, not just in the sense of losing a loved one, but also in the sense of um I guess allowing that space in your in yourself in your heart to greet to grieve when you've lost someone but also when you've kind of lost something else in your life that's not like a physical person or a human being like mourning a relationship mourning the loss of a job mourning moving house <laughs> you know um moving back home mourning the loss of your independence various losses that we experience um throughout our lives and um Cool, I see. So Dudu's joined us again today and she's posted a comment. Um, so I'd like to just go ahead and read that. Um, so Dudu says, I'm just gonna shift this a little bit. So Dudu says, um, um, an American woman I know, sorry, the kids are, <laughs> the kids are busy having a yelling match the side. I hope it's not, it wasn't too loud. Um, so Dudu says, an American woman I know recently went to a funeral in Khabane. To her, what she found most profound about the ceremony was the part where the men shovel the sand over the grave until the end. The lady who was sharing with me compared this with how in the States, it's hired help at the funeral parlor who do that part. She described it as a beautiful way to send off. Um, I'm sharing this, prompted by Ngozi's share on the COVID funeral, where we are noticing it as being a smaller affair when we are used to the community being there to hold each other during this time. It appears, even in the shaving down of the numbers of people who can attend, our rituals during funerals still demonstrate how we hold each other during this time of grieving. Mm -hmm. That is such a beautiful comment. Thank you so much, Duju. And especially your description of how we hold each other, you know? Ew. You know, and I mean, um, you know, this takes me back to, to Winnie Mandela's um, four one days, right? So there's a letter in there where that Mandela writes to her um, after he finds out about his eldest son passing, right? And and he's so aggrieved because I mean they won't let him go and bury his son mm. um, because he's in prison and they he, and he's just like you know what I've tried um, they just won't let me um, and all I just wanted to do was just give him like just send him off right mm. and then um, then he explains the the then, and then he says but I'll come and. Right? Um, when, 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 whenever I can. Um, and I know there's later on somewhere where he comes out. I saw this in a documentary where he actually does go to his son's grave and he literally picks up a stone and puts it on top of the other stones on the grave. So that, you know, just, you know, put in context the whole laying, you know, putting a stone on the grave aspect, aspect of it. You know, because it was like literally physically just saying with the stone, I am just helping you be comfortable, you know, last place of rest, right? And, and it just goes back to what, what you were saying about, about the ways in which we hold each other. I mean, that is such a powerful symbol, you know, just that stone, just putting that stone, just being there to put that stone down yes. and say, yeah. Yes. No, e exactly. Um um yo and then um so i'm gonna read this again um so that it's also you know a multiplicity of voices and experience and, and dudu has shared another example of um uh she she writes i i was once very 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 uncomfortable and and afraid even of death until i watched a friend die in a car accident we were in in 2006 and i survived Yo, sis. That tragic experience taught me also that death will come when it comes. The car accident we shared, but our time to die, but our time to die 
but at our time to die, we did not. Although I was in the car with her and it was my car, it was not my time. I also have been made aware of the two types of death they are, I believe. Our bodies die and our souls die. My soul died when I was actively addicted to crack and alcohol. Now in recovery, I'm resurrected. So for these reasons, I'm not afraid of death anymore. So I love how Belle talks about it. Yo, oh. <laughs> thank you so much, Dudu. Um, yo, uh, and I don't know, Dumelo, if if there's anything you'd like to maybe share or add um, or comment on what Dudu shared. Um, um, I I just also want to thank her for you know um always just showing up, you know, to, I mean, the last two days, I don't know if Lucy told you, to do, but the last two days, you know, I missed you personally. I was just like, ah, where's my girl? You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so lonely here. Yeah. <laughs> but she, you I mean, you know, the way you do is so open about everything. And I mean, it's such an inspiration first, right? How she's able to just, openly share whatever she's gone through, whatever she's going through. I'm just like, that creates so much space for, for us, for the rest of us, also to be like, hey, safe here, you know, and, you know, just, um, and, and the, that, that thing was that you've gone through stuff. Mm. So somebody reminds you or something reminds you, and I just, that's how I feel when I'm in the active right um but also her experience reminds me of um the well i i watched the film um what is this film what is the book the hate you give right oh right um, i didn't get a chance to yeah, watch that yet or read it <laughs> uh, so i don't want to kill it no too, go but... ahead girl go ahead go ahead but spoiler alert for those who haven't seen it <laughs> Yeah, so, um, so in the film, um, the protagonist is there with his, her friend, her lifelong friend, right? And they're, they're in the car, and he gets shot by a cop. And that whole experience, you know, the whole duty talking about that, I can only imagine how it feels, you know, to be in and to share an experience with somebody and then you survive and they don't. Mm. Um, I always think about it when, when, when you hear on the news, they say a mother killed five of her kids and she survived, you know, tried to kill herself and five of the kids, but she survived and the kids died. Mm. I'm always like, how do you then live with yourself? Right? How do you, what happened? Like, how do you, yeah, because you have like the physical memory of, of, I was there and so I'm not hearing it from somebody else. I'm not. You know, mm. it's not like second person experience. I was there and then, and I now need to, um, um, do you, like live with this memory. Right. Um, and I, oh, and I, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of felt there was like a child, um, a child that also died when I was there some years ago and it's a long story and I, I can't cut it short but I don't want to get into it but it's also that thing right and and it's also that thing that you were there and for me the family actually asked us like but how is it that our child died and you survived right yeah. how come you you yeah, but this one child died and you guys did not so yeah um but just um but also just moving on to more things I want to read um, from the so Bell um, by Bridget Davis, right? Um, yes. From 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 speaking of grief today, I feel real low. I don't understand. Um, so first, I will comment on the title, right? Today I feel real, so speaking of grief, today I feel real low, I hope you understand. When I read this, I was like, 
people actually why is it that we have to you know ask for permission feel low interesting point That's black right why is it that we have to be like actually i don't want to talk i don't want to deal with this i don't and everybody's just always like but what do you mean you're the one that has it together why are you falling apart how come you what are we supposed to do when you are falling apart right so i'm just like no yeah anyway i, I would just want to read it um shira i believe that on some level black women are used to tragedy mm-hmm. we expect it this is not a strange thing to to our world we've lost our fathers to in the tech our bra- frontline battle american women. our husbands and black on black crime or police brutality and our sons or update prisons all this while grappling with the burden of all that is black life in america babies born to babies dehumanizing ghettos inferior school low ages the top racism the slow but steady death of our people yeah um Uh, I mean, <laughs> how is that, right? So I read it and I was just like, this is so true. But I was also like, it just can't be right. Like, it can't be okay that you are just used to tragedy. And that's a thing. It's normal. It's a normalized state for black women. Yeah. When black women are used to feeling pain. And that is how things are. You know, we just used to, and we expected to like just take everything in and bottle it and put it in and put it on our heads and put it on our shoulders and you know put it on our wallets um, and everything, right? And ah, yeah, I don't think that's okay. I don't think that's okay. And that took me specifically right to an instance that that I went to with an ex where. Um, we had a conversation over the phone and then he was just like you know what i'm going to come and see you tomorrow and to see me i was at work into my workplace and we took a walk right the garden like why are you with i was i was full on dressed in full on black. in black yes and i yeah right and i oh i had cut my i was i was still like rocking my mohawk so i had cut the size of my head so it was at um a point where i was trying to grow my hair cuz i had like a mohawk for like the longest time so i had like hair on the side but that particular day i like after i had had that conversation with him i cut my hair on the side right and he was like why did you cut your hair why are you wearing black and my answer and i didn't flinch and i didn't think about it and i was i was very clear and i said i'm grieving right I was like I'm mourning and he's like what are you mourning and I was like you right mm. because after the station we had I was just like oh it needs to get rid of it. um this is it this is over just get into your main clothes start mourning yes that right um and 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 when I was reading the and I'm thinking about that that of Like that could be right. Like we can't be so petty because it's like the norm. You know, it track that we we just like you know you keep it just like like get yourself into it where the back of your head ready to let go, right? Yes. Um, like okay, cool, fine, and that that goes. I don't know where it goes back to. a part where um I was saying that on I don't know if, yeah we can't be sorry sis you were breaking that. up a little bit do you mind um going back a, a little bit to just the beginning of your sentence were you saying we okay I was just saying that, uh, yeah I was re- reading somewhere that we can't be sure of the things in our lives hmm. um Yeah, we can't be sure because of ah now my my thought process Sorry. like we can't be sure of the things in our lives because like, we need to just be ready to just let them go and and 
that's where things like trust issues come come through, right? Where even when you're in a relationship, you just can't you can't stand on both feet and be like, okay, I'm standing, right? Mm. You're always like on toes, expecting to walk out the door because of the way that our lives are structured, the way we are structured for trauma. I I really, I love that you've brought that up and that you've brought it up in that context as well. Um, because as you were talking, it caused me to think about, um, and I'm not sure why, but it caused me to think about kind of the, the ways, like I've read and I've read in various literature, like over, like over a couple of years, um, particularly because I was obsessed with a time with, I was obsessed for a time with uh, kind of goddess, like goddess culture and goddess feminism. And um, there are a number of um, kind of deities and a number of them are female deities who who guard the gates, like they guard the gates, they are the ones who reign over death. It's like this thing, it's a metaphor as well that, you know, women do the thing where we usher in life, but then we're also kind of the keepers of death. And we're the, we're the ones who mourn, like even in funeral kind of settings, the women are the ones who mourn, we're the ones who cry and wail. And it's almost as if the, like, if in a situation where, around the grave you know people are kind of holding in um their emotions and being quite stoic there will be the women at the funeral who are there and they're wailing and they're 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 expressing physically the kind of grief of the community so in a way um even as bell says yes we are familiar with death um, especially, you know, as black women, I think it, it is that, but in that it's not to necessarily say that it's, um, it can be hectic and heavy for us, but I think it's also, it can also be viewed as a place of power really, and a place for us to be able to say, yes, like, I, I love how you responded to your former lover and you said, I'm mourning you because you took control and you took power of that process of change and mourning the moving on of your relationship. And it was, it was you who decided to go through the, that process, you know, of like, of mourning and of change because nothing in life is certain. Like that's something that I learned and became very kind of open and apparent in my life recently in the last few months um where i um i was on this kind of fresh new start fresh new beginning all this optimism towards the middle of last year and then by the end of last year so many things had changed my like my work situation had changed my home situation had changed of course um and i felt like i was mourning and grieving not just the yeah, like, not just the fact that, oh, you know, like, I'd lost my job, but, oh, not just that, but all of the things that I had associated with that, all of the, all of the, the, the ways that I had seen, you know, my life kind of progressing or growing because of that. Um, and having to come to terms with that and not really realizing actually that I was grieving because girl, I got like, I got depressed. I was kind of sleeping all the time, watching Netflix all the time, um, drinking all the time. So I didn't even realize what I was grieving. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I was like, I'm yeah. grieving. Like, I'm like, I'm so depressed, but why? Because, you know, if you, when you, when you, you, you have to, you have to keep the motions going. Like you're like, oh, okay, so now I must, look for new employment, I must look for clients, I must do this, I must, you know, keep it moving, keep it moving. But I had felt such a profound sense of loss that I wasn't even registering as like loss over this particular thing in this particular situation. 
Um, and I will. And do do just ask that um, I please share some of the information on uh, the goddess fem feminism that <laughs> I've been reading yeah. up on. No, definitely. Like I'd be glad to share any like resources um, after this. I'll do, I'll do that. Um, um, I know I feel like I've been talking forever, but I'd really love to read this part of the book. But I'm also looking through my <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, um, and I'm just like, ah, where did the time go? Right. Girl, because it's like, we've got 15 minutes left. It's so intense because it's uh, so intense. Um, yeah. So on that um, sort of grief, depression, um, Bell writes, depression as defined by psychologists generally involves quitting or giving up, feeling that present conditions and future possibilities are intolerable. The depressed person goes on strike from life, doing less and less and losing interest in people, work, hobbies, and so on. Excuse me. Such depression is strongly linked with cancer. Although depressed black females may completely withdraw in private life, in the public realm, we will often continue to present a mask of normalcy, even when we know we're suffering, suffering life-threatening blues. Many of us suffer periods of suicidal depression that no one ever notices. In black life, suicide, like so many other illnesses and behaviors related to the realm of psychological breakdown, tends to be seen as the gesture of a weak person. For years, many Black people perpetuated and believed the myth that Black folks did not commit suicide. That is a myth that is now brutally shattered by the overwhelming evidence that Black folks, women, men, and children are killing ourselves daily. Still, in a context where suicide is still seen as a sign of weakness and a character flaw, it's difficult for individuals to confess suicidal states and suicidal feelings. So I'm going to stop reading now because she goes into her tenure and da, 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 da. but <laughs> yep. So whew, I made so many notes on this chapter, guys, like 10 pages of notes. Um, but I, yeah, so just on that point of suicide, right? Mm. Um, and thank you for bringing it up. I, I, I was like thinking up, it made me think about how, what it means to like the black society, what suicide means to the black society, what, what it looks like, right? Mm. Where it look, it, it feels and it looks like you are leaving people and work behind. So it's never about you. So what, like some years ago, I was like, I was living with my grandmother and volunteering at the primary school there, right? And then one of the girls that I was volunteering with years later, like two years ago, killed herself, right? And she has three mm -hmm. kids. And she was a single mother. When when this happened, I was visiting my grandma for him. How she said, how she said, killed herself. But, you know, I don't, so she's so, right? And she's like, you know, this girl killed herself. And I don't know who she's expecting to take care of her kids. She's left such a burden for her mom. Wow. Right, and and I remember writing something about it, and I'm like, but you know, obviously the you know the thought process that goes into killing yourself, guys, is not you don't wake up one day and you're like, I'm gonna kill myself. No way, <laughs> never. I've never heard anyone say, I woke up one day. Okay, no, <laughs> let me not say. That. Yeah, but I've never heard anyone saying, you know, I was suicidal. I woke up one day and I killed myself, mm. and it happened. You know, and. Um, and I keep, and every time I think about suicide, I think about Taiwan Mulelekwa and Silodeka, you know, and I, I, you know, I'm just like, ah, why is it that people see the act, right, and not everything that led to you, you know, nobody goes through the thing, and Bell, right? nobody goes through, nobody takes the time to go through why this person put it this way. Or to kill themselves, or what? Oh, come! Oh, long thinking up. Long they've been meditating on this, yes. right? Always about what we find, right? Yes. Like so. 
when I was like far, far young, for one attempt that I tried at suicide, I was in like the 11th grade. And I, I called the appeal house and I, it made me sleep for two days. And when I woke up, my parents were just like, you're away. What? And I'm like, okay. Hey. And they were like, so you try to kill yourself. I was like, um, kept quiet. And they just, and my mom was just like, so you will die, right? And uh, we're going to bury you. We're going to cry. Right? And then, but then we will go on with our lives. Like, two weeks from now, we would have gone on with our lives and, you know, back into our normal seat. Mm. And you lost your life. You would have lost your future. You would have lost your work. You would have, right? All of that. And you would have gone on. And... <laughs> But it, it also goes back to the whole, you would have just left a whole lot behind, right? It was never about why I was trying to kill myself, what, you know, you know what, I was, what I was going through. It was just like, okay, so you were going to behind. And that's <laughs> what happens. I've heard women, I've heard like mothers say, I've thought so many times about killing myself, but I always think about my children because... Who's gonna take care of my kids when get I'm home? Gone? Wait till I get home. <laughs> that time where you like you actually think about it, like you're you're in because you're right. Like the process to attempt, like the process, like the thought process and the emotional process leading up to a place where you actually thoroughly believe that everyone would be okay without you and you also just want to end your suffering it's not something you just kind of wake up and decide it you go to you it you like you think about it and yeah. someone and and you know someone who who tends or who yeah who has a tendency to suicidal thoughts might think girl and please eh? that time where um you're like yeah, maybe I should just kind of end it now because also I have life insurance. So that means that at least the kids, but they are ID for school fees going forward. Um, so that will be covered. Um, you know, like you, you, you're sitting there and you're like rationalizing this thing. Like you're actually like rationalizing this thing, but the yeah. thing that always brings you back to like quote unquote, normalcy is like a okay on the one hand they'll be taken care of financially you know by life insurance but huh? but who's going to take care of them like you can't leave the kids behind like so you you have to be there so you 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 basically like all right all right i'll get out of bed now today and do this and this and this because the kids like it's not even for you anymore it's because you want to be present for your children and that's why when i've heard people say things like you know my kids changed my life or my kids saved my life i can completely relate with that because and it's yeah. not just that one time when you had them and they saved your life it's like mm -hmm. whenever you're uh on the brink or on the edge you think oh but my children and then you bring yourself back but before i divert too much you also spoke about something so beautiful um and sad when you when i think it was sad and poignant and maybe not so beautiful but we think about the act like you're saying more than the thought process that leads up to the act and i think it speaks back and it goes back again to those like us not being able to express that we are in pain or that we're not able to cope or that we are experiencing some difficulty and not being able to find support in our various communities, whether it's family or friendships or a lover um, who'd be able to pull you back from the edge, you know, and, um, and comfort you, you know, and, um, encourage and support and affirm to bring you back from the edge. It's always just like 
toughen up. Why are you being weak? Until the weakness literally, the weakness literally kills you, like literally. And then you become a burden still. Like it's just, it's a really interesting, I don't know. I, I find it interesting and sad <laughs> at the same time. Like, um, and then Dudu was saying, um, um, I'm gonna read, yeah, is I'm just gonna read um Dudu was sharing. Wow, my own voice. I feel like I've been talking for so long. <laughs> Dudu writes on the importance of holding each other during times of depression. When she shares about the about McLean who committed suicide, I love that quote that says, and she quotes. Where was the circle of love that could have embraced and held her when she surrendered to her grief and the pain that was within her? Why was there no healing place? Besides my notes on this quote, I wrote, let these words not be said where I am. It's important for me to be there for the people whom I love. I don't want anyone who knows I love them to ever feel alone and like they have had no one. There's a discussion. There's a discussion here on my codependent issues, lol, <laughs> girl. Um, but seriously, though, I'm a true believer in being there for each other, and being a healing place and making a healing place available. I believe in the power of circles. I believe in the power for circles of love and being a member of them. Oh, girl, yes. <laughs> I want to just read quickly uh, something that she wrote. Um, she wrote, she writes, Bell writes, um, individual black women must ask ourselves, where are the spaces in our lives where we are able to acknowledge our pain and express grief? Um, and there's somewhere else earlier where she speaks about psycho, home psychoanalysis when she was talking about her sister, where she was dressed and she went home. And I have a colleague that, um, you know, when she told us that she has like a mental health problem, she was just like, bring home. Mm. And I'm going to go sit with my family because that's how we deal with, that's how in Nigeria we do the whole mental health thing. So if you're not okay, you need to go back to a familiar space where people that love you, yes. where they will, you, you avoid by all costs being alone. So you go into a space where people love you, where they'll come in and they'll speak to you and then they'll, you know, they'll bring you back from this repressive space that, that you tend to go in. And I felt like that was so important, that home side courses. And you don't have, a lot of us don't have, maybe just go home yeah. and we're okay, right? Yeah. Home because such a happy space, it's such a good place for us to be. It's a um, real privilege. Yeah. It's a real privilege. Um, there was an experience I had once um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. with a number of extremely amazing women um, who kind of work in the energy healing, ancestral healing, um, spiritual leadership space. Um, mm -hmm. And there was just like a group of us, I think in total, nearly maybe 10, this was maybe a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And these women had curated a half day retreat, basically. And it was all kind of like 10 of us at a very like quiet, leafy location outside. We did yoga, we did some journaling, which is really beautiful that also Belle brings in um, as part of her own process in, in the chapter. Um, and then girl, there was a session led by a sister named Joy, Joy Mohami and Joy led us in a process of identifying the spaces in our hearts that were tender. And we basically went around the circle and each woman got a chance to speak about the places where her heart was tender. And we cried together. We listened to each other. Nobody judged, very few people offered any kind of advice because it wasn't like an advisory thing. It was literally yeah. just a space to cry. Like, it's literally just like, oh, here's a space. You want to cry? You want to talk? You want to open your heart? We are here for you. Strangers, mind you. 
<laughs> as well. It wasn't necessarily like um, bosom sisters or, you know, BFFs, but it was literally like, we didn't know each other when we, like not yeah. all of us knew each other when we came to the space, but the fact that yeah. we were able to make that space available and please, can we bring that back? Like, can we just keep bringing that back and making that space available for each other everywhere? It yeah. doesn't need a, re a retreat. It's true. Um, uh, yeah. And you know, and when you're talking about, I'm, I'm thinking about something that I was invited to, um, was like similar retreat type of thing, right? Um, by, um, a lady at Budagila Africa, so there's this artist re residency mm. um, at 1005 Arcadia Street in Pretoria. And Kinelue had invited me to this thing, and it had the same type of vibe, right? But I didn't go because it was just going to be a woman's thing. <laughs> You're like, why? <laughs> Tampon Festival. Um, okay, I'm kidding. That was rude. Yeah. <laughs> Just like I don't want to be in like that type of space, but those spaces are important, right? Mm. Um, and I want to touch on. Maybe we can maybe just share one song. The the important of the importance of music mm. in um preparing ourselves for loss. Uh, and I have a song, right? And I used to play the song on repeat for years, mind you, for years. Um, so it's Tepotula's Hulukile. Um, yeah, and it's, I mean, the, the gist of the song is um, just teach me to understand mm. that whatever I, you know, no matter how much I love it, it's okay. It's okay. It is well. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Um, and I, I, I think, I mean, we've, we've basically clocked the hour now. Um, and even though I feel like we could talk and talk the whole time, I think it's such a beautiful place to maybe bring today's session to a close because despite all of the places where we may experience loss in our lives and the various ways that we may experience loss in our lives. It is well, it's not, it's not always forever. And, and it gives us an opportunity to just kind of allow ourselves those spaces to grieve. And, um, and it is well, like it is well, like it'll, it'll be okay. It's not always, it's not forever, you know? Yeah. Um, so in closing, I just want to. <laughs> <laughs> so Dumela's little baby Adang just came running and jumping into Mama's arms. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just want to close by saying, um, taking I'm taking this from the book. She writes, "Being used to pain does not mean that we are not overwhelmed or destroyed by grief." Mm. So. Thank you, everyone, again, for joining us um, tomorrow. Yes, thank you so much. Much love. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>